Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hope you all had some great conversations at your table. Um, I think probably the most appropriate way to start today's meeting is with a little poetry from uh, the great poets Nickelback. Any Nickelback fans out there? All right, great. Know your audience. Wonderful. All right. <clears throat> You can look them up. You guys know who Nickelback is. Uh, they wrote recently in one of their hit songs, There's clothes all over the floor. I don't remember them being there before. The smell of perfume isn't here. Why is lipstick on the mirror? I still don't understand. No pictures left in the hall. Three new holes in my wall. Where the hell's my credit card? Why is my wallet in the yard? I still don't understand. Well, now, I guess, I should have listened. And, uh, obviously, he got in trouble with someone, and she took it out on him. We're going to talk about listening today, and how that frames in the sales process, how that plays out in marketing. And we have a great panel here to discuss it with us. I'm going to go through them very briefly because their bios are about six pages long, uh, so I won't read them to you. Start with Mary Ford. Mary leads CB on Sales Operation Organization, and in this role, she's responsible for all sales operation functions, including sales execution, sales recruiting, sales engineering, marketing, market response, sales reporting, salesforce automation, market development, and promotions management. So if it's got sales in front of it, Mary pretty much touches it over at Cbion. Uh, she has a, a, a great previous career, very rich in companies she worked for like MCI, WorldCom, and Anderson Consulting. And she is an avid runner on the board of the Atlanta Track Club and Dress for Success. Uh, next, in, next to um, Mary, we have Neil. Neil is in charge of global marketing for Ebix. Uh, previously, he lived and worked in Australia, where he ran the marketing for e-business division of Australia's largest telecom. Um, Ebix, if you're not familiar with them, and I'm going to get this right, is the fourth fastest growing, the sixth fastest growing technology company on Forbes list. So, and they're uh, headquartered here in Atlanta. In case you didn't know that. Next to Neil, we have Don Turner of Applied System Intelligence. Don is president and chief executive officer over there. They're a provider of artificial intelligence solutions to the military intelligence and commercial community. Don can kill you with his pinky. Um, he's, he's spent uh, about a third of his career in the corporate world, a third with uh, international technology companies, which he's helped to restart or reboot. Um, and third with uh, turnarounds. And as I said, he can kill you with his pinky, so be nice to Don. Emmy Weber, Vice President of Marketing for Surgical Information Systems. She leads Surgical Information Systems Marketing Strategy, um, aimed at effective positioning and promotion, promotions of their solutions to the healthcare market. And she too has worked with a number of great healthcare companies as well as Atlanta companies, including uh, Linear Worldwide back in the day, and a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism, so a J School graduate like myself. And then last but not least, Mark Wilson, the CEO of eVerifile. Uh, he acts as the president and CEO of Atlanta-based eVerifile, a privately held company that specializes in delivering fast, powerful employee screening and support systems for organizations all over the world. Uh, he recently was part of a group that earlier this year um, uh, acquired the company, which included Frontier Capital and Magic Johnson Enterprises. So if you need tickets to any type of event, you know, he's about the best connection to offer up. Um, uh, previously was founder of, of Ryla Teleservices, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, for uh, many years was known as one of the fastest growing private companies here in Atlanta until it was sold and um, he's led a great career over there. So, that's our panel. We're gonna to talk today about the fact that like, like fiends, 
And the question is, have we lost the customer amid all of our efforts to market to them? So I'm going to throw out there to the panel, to anyone who wants to go first, the question, do you feel there has been pressure to sell more and listen less over the past few years inside enterprises? Go for it, go on. Is on? Okay. Um, there has been, and the primary reason is because of the growth of the Internet. There's so many different ways that people can uh, reach out to customers via the Internet, via email, mass mailings, things like that that there's been a trade-off where they're now trying to generate, in many companies that I've seen, have generate, the focus is more on generating a lot of leads rather than only taking care of your existing customers. And as everybody knows, it takes much more money, much more effort to win over a new customer than to maintain a current customer. So I think part of the problem is that with the internet, there's been so much more growth of leads that people haven't taken the quality time to listen to current customers. Okay. Um, I know all of your organizations, having spent some time speaking with you all, are, are actively practicing listening to the customers. Can one of you share with us uh, who owns that mandate inside your organization and how do you get it uh, started? I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, in our organization, client operations, who is closest to day-to-day -day taking care of our customers, so think implementation, training, support services, um, would have that mandate and supported by every organization, including marketing, to um, help them listen and react to their customers. And how do they share what they learn with the rest of the organization? Is there an operational way right. to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So we use our CRM, um, and so our entire company is on one system. So theoretically, anybody should be able to look into the CRM and see anything they want to know about that client and it should be updated. So that's one tool. Uh, we started using what I call internal social media to try to um, kind of make it more accessible. So it's kind of like an internal um, IM string, but it's in the CRM, so it's recorded in there. So we try to use tools like that. I'll jump in there, Mike. Great. Good morning, everyone. At, at CB you may or may not know, we provide technology and communication services to small businesses. So we've got over 60,000 customers across the U.S., I believe. Many of you in the room may be acquainted with our CEO, Jim Geiger. But for us, listening to our customers is something that is systemic across the company. And if I think back to some of the things that are important to our culture, one of them is what we call a culture of referrals. And Jim would describe that as having customers that are so satisfied with their see Beyond experience that they enthusiastically refer their friends, family, and business associates to us. That was one of the, the founding principles of see Beyond nearly 13 years ago. And to ensure that we were making that real and we were actually creating culture of referrals among our customers, we decided from the very beginning to actually ask them. And we started doing a, a customer survey process that certainly has grown. And one of the questions on there was, would you refer C Beyond? And sometimes, many times the answer is yes, and certainly sometimes the answer is no, and those are situations that we pay attention to. But that survey process has grown over the years. And when I say systemic, I mean everybody in the company is, needs to pay attention to it because what we call our CSAT score is actually part of everyone's bonus in the company. So there's a process to go through objectives and understand how each organization is contributing to improving our CSAT scores, which of course then requires that we're listening and understanding how each department can play a role. So yes, it's marketing, yes, it's customer operations, but it's something that's prominently displayed on our internal website so that everybody can see how we're doing in the eyes of our customers. Neil, I know you guys over at Ebex are, are doing some things that involve both social media and, and traditional face-to-face -face in terms of uh, uh, pulling information from customers. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I was reading recently that uh, they say now business decisions, especially buying decisions by other uh, customers, a lot of it is, 50% of it is based on peer influence. So we're starting to use our clients currently to influence future clients. So using them as sort of brand champions, whether we ask them to speak at a user conference, whether we ask them to start conversation on social media with LinkedIn groups, uh, Facebook, Twitter, things like that. LinkedIn's become a huge thing for us because we're starting to 
enable real avid users of our products to feel like they're more involved in the company than you know than they were previously. We give them sort of a, a free reign to be be a part of Evix and they get on there and they talk about their experience with the products and they talk about how it's influenced their business and how they're using it to save time, save money, make more money. And I think just hearing that from someone who's already working in the industry or is an influence, for instance, MetLife, if we get them talking, we put them in front of our current customers, we put them in front of future customers and people listen because they're MetLife. And I think the story coming from a third party's mouth is a lot more, how would I say, important than it coming from e Evix's mouth. So. Mark, I know that your organization is actually, as you've uh, gone into different markets and, and investigated different markets, uh, done a lot of face-to-face -face with uh, people in that market to make sure that, that you know what they're needing and you can share a little bit of that with the group. Yeah, well, in, in the current company, it's, um, you know, actually I've had the, I guess I want to call it the privilege of uh, working in, in uh, two different lines of business that were highly commoditized. You know, there's, there's a lot of crowded spaces where there are a lot of companies that do what we do. And so in either example, to for us to have a chance of being successful, we, we definitely had to have a strategy of trying to understand you know, just what it would take for us to, to, to be seen as different. And the only way to do that, we felt, was to, to, to do that in, in a face-to-face -face way. And in the current situation, I'm spending most of my time uh, traveling out to existing customers. I think the point was made here. It's, it's easier to you know, sort of start with what you have and, and, and try to build upon that. Uh, and if you can do that from, from an educated uh, point of view, then you know, again, our feeling is that we, we'll, we'll have a chance for being successful. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you really have to, in, uh, in, in these areas where there's others that are doing what you do, pay really close attention to to what customers are saying that, that, that it is that's important to them. And we're finding now that uh, it's, it's really the, the, the simple things that a lot of folks say that they do, that they don't do as well, uh, that we're focusing on, uh, that are, that's gonna put us in position, I think, to, you know, to, to be pretty successful in, in this new new adventure as we were in the, in the last company that we sold a couple years ago. To, to play at that point, I know that Don, you've got some some interesting ideas around the idea around how technology uh, and marketing and working with customers and technology companies can be different because many times they don't know what they need and it's not out of ignorance; it's just out of availability. Um, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Standard soapbox answer. Sure. Um, you know, well, I, I've had a chance to work with a lot of various technologies in advanced technologies. In general, customers. Is, I think Arthur C. Clarke once said that any sufficiently advanced technology appears as black magic to the masses. And that's the fact, because you can listen to your customer, but sometimes they don't even know what to tell you. The best example I can give you is, uh, you know, traditional marketing is you ask the customer what they want, and they tell you, and if there's a business case there, you make it. 92 million households in America, 25 million households have high people in them. Of those 25 million households, there's about 11 million where everybody likes toast in the morning. Toasters only come in four slots. As a traditional marketer, I go out there, I interview people, I take a sample size. Uh, and I say, you know what, I think I can sell two million five-slot toasters. I go, I present my business case to management, they approve it, and that's what we do. We make a five-slot toaster. In high-tech marketing, the customers, you can't ask them what they want because they don't know in many cases. Best example, if I go back and I date myself, if you go back to the 70s, and everybody's walking around these big boom boxes on their shoulders. And if you ask the customer what they want as a traditional marketer, they say, well, I like a rubber pad on the thing because it sucker's heavy, and it only takes 10 D batteries, I'd like 20 D batteries, so it plays all day at the beach. That's traditional marketing. That's what the customers would have asked. Sony at the time um, was a world leader in electronic miniaturization. And with all the, without going into all the godly goop words about strategy, the essence of strategy is to identify macro trends that you're willing to invest in. That's what strategy is. Sony said, look at macro trend. People are listening to music more and more often in a, uh, in a mobile fashion. What can we do with the voodoo we do to fundamentally change how they listen to music? That's how the Sony Walkman was born. It was not based on a, on a market survey. Nobody back then, when they're walking around these big boom boxes, said, well, I would like something on my belt with some headphones. They didn't know it was possible. Um, so, you know, I 
my, our company sells highly cognitive artificial intelligence software. I've yet to find somebody, a customer, saying, you know, I'm looking for a hierarchical cognitive artificial intelligence software. Uh, they don't know what's, what's possible. So with traditional marketing, you ask what they want. With high-tech marketing, you've got to get in and understand their business so well that you can, and sometimes better than they do themselves, so that you can say, how can we fundamentally change your business with what we do? Okay. Amy, how does that play into building out personas? Um, it, it definitely and, and share a little bit with the, with the group in case some folks aren't more familiar with that process. Yeah, first off, I would say I completely agree um, with Don in that um, from a marketing perspective, I think we figure out um, you know what they need that right now, but then there's a second part of that was figuring out what they don't know they need down the road. So I think as marketing, we sort of have a dual focus there because we have to sell today and we have to uh, position to be viable down the road. Um, but we have taken segmentation pretty detailed. So when you're in high tech, you don't live in an isolated world. So you really have to understand what else is going on in the ecosystem and how you play into that. So both from a segmentation of what else is in the IT world in that segment of customers and then who you're selling to. So the buying persona has become very important for us. And we've taken that pretty detailed into um, just not only high level, what does the CIO care about um, and the different things, but down to based on what their ecosystem is, what they care about. And then how are those used, though, mm -hmm. within your organization? So we, we use those across the organization, both in um, educating the sales team um, and how you position your solutions based on the buyer persona, how we talk to them, because there's um, a lot of noise you know, between the um, email campaigns and direct mail and the website. So we're trying to have a conversation um, with a person um, and making it very real to them so they respond better. So we're trying to increase our conversion rates by not talking to everybody, but to specific personas. Okay. Anyone else on the panel have anything to add around personas? <laughs> Just checking, I saw some lean forward, so I wasn't sure that. Um, Mayor, I know CB on uh, earlier this year, end of last year, announced uh, uh, kind of a fundamental change in, in the um, uh, the target market that you're going after and, and expansion. See down 2.0 it's been referred to uh, by some folks, and I, I think that uh, um, getting uh, very deep into the prospects and customers' mind played heavily into that role in a unique way, even with the executive team. Can you share a little bit about what you guys are doing and how the whole executive and senior leadership team got involved in? understanding um, the buyer and listening to them. Absolutely. Just um, as a way of a little bit of background, when Stevion first started 12 years ago, nearly 13 years ago, we brought an innovative uh, value proposition to the marketplace in terms of small business technology. And over the years, that certainly got copied and other competitors came in. So we've gone through two, I'd say, shifts in our business. The first with the addition of mobile technology came specifically because we listened to our customers. I mentioned that survey where we asked customers, would you refer C beyond? The next question in that survey was, what else do you want to buy from us? And they told us very clearly, we want to buy mobile services. So we went through that shift about 2005. And then a couple of years ago, we realized that we needed to go through another transformation in our business. Our value proposition felt like it was getting a little stale with our target market. And we saw some interesting trends in the customer service side of our business that caused us to delve into more research to really understand who our customers were. Found some very interesting things like those that were happier with us were spending more money with us, which we loved. Okay. And so through that research, we were able to get in and really understand that we had two different segments of customers that were buying from us. And to understand that even further, we, as Mike mentioned, engaged our executive team to fan out into the community, specifically here in Atlanta, and talk to um, several customers each, just have that one-on-one -on -one sit down conversation face-to-face and really listen to our customers understand what they were going through. So that feedback has helped um, craft and finalize the strategy, our transformation to it, as Mike referred to it, 
that we're going through now, and that really has two parts. One part of that new strategy is a change in our value proposition. So we're now enabling small businesses to leverage cloud technology, bringing the intersection of network and cloud to small business. But then secondly, and really more appropriate to this topic, is that we have learned that we need to approach our customers in a different way to sell them that new value proposition. So that is driving changes in our sales organization, um, different tools that we use to have those conversations and to focus on not just acquiring new customers, but also finding ways to make sure we're maximizing the revenue opportunity with our existing customers. So getting out into the field and speaking face-to-face -face was certainly a very important part of validating that strategy for us, um, and we're moving forward with it aggressively. And, and I know, um, having the privilege of working with you guys, that um, I think that uh, that direct interaction with the senior leadership team and the executives with customers uh, made some change in how the organization operates. I know that you guys are doing internal case studies on customers to share with the sales team so they can you know, see internally how the sales w uh, went about and, and happened and what was useful. And, and those tools have been very you know, popular within your organization, I know. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I was just going to throw out, you know, when I was in Computer Vision uh, years ago, I was a billion dollar corporation, but every executive had a list of about 50 customers and they were prioritized where you had to make two customer visits every month and you had to make like 10 customer calls every month. And you were an executive, you were in the sales, look at this is not a sales call, I'm just calling to see how things are going. But they for that first off, it allowed the executives to really stay close to what's going on in the customer base. But also it's good for the whole organization because the you know, executives weren't living up in, in their ivory tower, they knew what was going on. And that kind of kept the organization on its toes also to keep abreast of what's going on with customers. But again, it was a formal program for the executives to actually go out and talk to customers on a routine basis. Does anyone else have programs like that? Right. And not, not necessarily a program, but just to, to, to carry on the point. Um, I think in terms of trying to really have your customers understand and know who you are culturally as a company, senior, senior leadership should represent that. And so, you know, it's been a, um, a real priority for, for my company to, to make sure that our culture is being presented by those on the senior team and, and primarily me in a smaller company, uh, getting out and, and making sure that I give that message, messaging. Uh, it just makes so, so much difference, especially if there's transition. And you know, we're in a transition where there was one leadership team in the company being us buying the company now, where um, customers really need to know and understand what the new vision is, what it is that you know we're trying to do as, as a company, and then how it is that they can benefit from it. So. You know, I just really, I want to support what's being said here. I think, uh, you know, whether it's a formalized program or just, you know, the, the initiative being taken by senior executives, leadership in the company to go out and interface with their clients um, uh, is very important. Um, I would just add to that, um, we also have a survey process, as most of you guys probably do, but I think the thing about the survey process is also the follow-up. So um, whether it's executives or across the board, um, putting in the processes that require follow-up, because customers are willing to talk to you, but if you don't um, listen and understand and have a dialogue, they're going to stop talking to you. Um, and so I think it's, it's difficult and it, it takes a lot of um, time and effort and resource, but you have to put a, a, place, a plan in place that follows up. You might not be able to solve every problem, and you might not have the answer for everything, but if you don't have a process that lets people understand that they have been heard and they're in a dialogue, um, I think you run the risk of even alienating your customers more. And like I just, I, I, this, this is really important with what's being said here because those companies that are customers of ours um, understand and know that they have a place to go with me as the CEO or any of our other leaders uh, to the extent that that, that that really is real for them it does put us in such a good position to grow the relationship and to try to do what we're trying to do with, with increased um, business from them, just from a relationship standpoint. Um, and to put a, put a real fine point on it, in the last company, we had, and this is not uh, you know, uh, a statement against salespeople, because it's nothing but sales, sales executives and, and folks that have that as, a, as what they do, but in the last company, we didn't have one salesperson 
literally not one salesperson in the, com in the company and grew it to 100 plus million. So, and it was all about relationships and customers feeling good with the leadership in the company about how it is that we were going to attend to their needs and you know understand their business, develop product solution around that understanding is what was, I think, the key for, for that success. Yeah, and, and um, I know as someone involved in marketing that when marketing can, can get involved in that, go on sales calls, talk to customers, um, that's uh, far more powerful uh, for us as marketers and as public relations side folks. And we work with clients that haven't you know, talked to customers since you know, Mosaic was the most popular web browser out there. We you know, quickly advise them to make sure that the marketing uh, team is out there in the, in the field knowing what's going on. Well, this is the Technology Executives Roundtable. So, so what role can technology play in helping organizations uh, listen to and understand the buyers uh, better? Or what types of technologies do you guys use? I know you talked internally about uh, CRM systems and such. Yeah, and I think that's internal, but, but external, you know, I think one of our challenges is, as marketers and sales folks is, is there's, there's so much information coming in um, about a buyer. You know, they're, you're watching what they do on the website, you're watching the social media, you're, we're doing a lot more with LinkedIn as well. I mean, there's so many avenues. The key is how do you get a profile built of a client that's updated real time so you can really, you know, figure out what those those signals are. And, and there are a lot of technologies out there. Um, you know, everything from the, the automation platforms, you know, to the websites doing more. So I think it's just um, there's a lot of data as marketers where you have to figure out how to most effectively use it to. Uh, drive customer retention and to uh, grow sales. Um, Mike, there's a convergence of happening right now, and it's, it's actually a very interesting time as a marketeer to watch it. But you know, the buzzword du jour is big data. But there's several things that are required to make this happen. It is social media generates big data? Big data by itself is worthless. You need nat things like natural language processing to be able to look at heterogeneous types of data and make sense of it. But even then, that's not enough because now we're talking, we're right now working with a client that's dealing with billions of transactions a month, and they want to be able to understand what the customers are saying about them and all these billion messages and things like that. Um, that's where you know our, we start applying machine learning and artificial intelligence to that because there's so much data that you risk alienating customers because you just can't pay attention to what they're saying. So we're looking at solutions now using artificial intelligence and I don't, I'm not here to put a plug for the company, but just it's a convergence going where the artificial intelligence emulates a thousand marketeers. So you can make tens of thousands of customer decisions in a few minutes as a way to get closer to them. And more importantly, is it highlights and says, look, at, you've just seen a billion transactions. There's you know these 50 transactions, these 50 messages, these 50 emotions or comments from customers you need to do something about it. So what we're doing is we're going through all this, we're making sense of it, and then we're saying, we're still keeping a human in the loop and say, of all everything going on, here's what you really need to pay attention to relative to your customers. And again, it's just, you know, we're gonna have to get more, we're gonna have to get smarter and smarter with the application of technology, because, you know, what they say, I think the number is right now 10 to the 18th, there's an exabyte of data created in the world every day. You don't have enough humans, you don't have enough customer service people, you don't have enough marketers, you don't have enough executives or salespeople to listen to everything that's going on out there. So you've got to use technology to do a better job of listening and highlight those things you need to react to. Uh, you brought up an interesting point with, you know, just even beyond big data, um, how do you effectively get customer intelligence throughout the entire organization? You've got contact centers and customer uh, customer reps and support folks that are taking in information from customers. You have sales folks that are meeting with customers and prospects and coming back with information. You have marketers. You know, who, who owns, or in your opinions, all five of your opinions, who owns the uh, mandate to try to pull that information together as best as we can and then pump it back out to the organization in some bigger pieces rather than small chunks? I'll throw off one quick thing is um, the obviously your CRM programs, things like that. Is everybody who touches a customer needs to have a way to take that knowledge and apply. I mean, back before the days of the internet, I mean, Honeywell, you know, 
process control division was outstanding back in the 80s is every time you talk to a customer, you document where they went to school, what the kids' names were, what they liked, what they disliked, the companies they used to work for, uh, the products they liked, and, you know, all of their affinities. Well, now we've got all the ability to do this all electronically, but it doesn't happen sometimes. Why? Because you don't make it easy. Um, one of the things I've done with my last company is all the salespeople had, uh, you know, we bought them their smartphones, we uh, voice enabled them, so that as soon as they left a client site before they got on their next call or the next thing, they could just and talk to them and record it all the thoughts, everything they learned about that meeting. And then who owns that, that all comes in to me, the definitely goes into marketing, because marketing is responsible for taking it and identifying future customer needs. So and it's got to be. The key thing I want to mention is just, it's got to be easy for people to use or they won't use it. You won't get that input. Right. Yeah, I agree. And it is not easy to make it easy um, to do. So, you know, there's probably some ideas for other companies out there in that statement. Um, and it definitely is marketing. Marketing, you know, needs to kind of be that central repository. And I think what comes back out of it depends on which audience you're packaging it up for. You know, there's certain things you're packaging up for product management. Um, there's certain things you're packaging up for sales. You know, to use uh, day to day, um, you know, for services, there's things. So I think it depends on the audience. The key is synthesizing, and again, it is hard to do because you're limited by humans today. So there's as technology gets better and the tools get better, you know, we'll be able to spot trends earlier. Um, I think there's a difference between marketing for a smaller company where you can still know every customer intimately. Um, and as you're growing a business, as opposed to something that Don might be doing where you're Coke and you're trying to spot trends over you know, hundreds of thousands of people, so you're looking for that big data to tell you uh, directionally, whereas you're looking at very specific customers. So I think a lot depends on what uh, type and size of company you currently are and where you're trying to grow to and how you would approach it. Mary, uh, so two for marketing. You're in charge of sales operation. Um, what do you think about uh, pulling this information together? Who should, who should own that and how should that be pumped back into the organization? I think the information comes in from so many different sources. Certainly there is the information that sales is collecting out in the field when it's talking to new prospects. There's the information that our engineers are able to gather as they're watching how our customers use the services that we provide them. And then there's an area of information that we get from our customer care teams where they're directly on the phones every day listening to what customers need from us that could help them grow their businesses. So lot, we get lots of great information. You're right, it's a lot. It's sometimes overwhelming to absorb it all, but I also agree that in the end it comes down to the marketing team's responsibility to pull it all together, synthesize it, and put together what is that right product roadmap that's going to maximize the revenue opportunities for the company that are also meeting the customer's needs. Neil? I completely, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, coming from a marketing perspective. Running the table. <laughs> marketing, <laughs> what's it called? We, uh, we do get a lot of information and it's really hard to dissect it. I think being I mean, we put people in positions where there is of certain teams. So we have, you know, product marketing, and we have people that deal directly with the sales teams, that deal directly with the relationship managers, deal directly with the social media people. It's pulling all that information in, then turning it into something useful. That's where it gets hard because you are getting so much information from the industry, and a lot of the time, it's not. A lot of it's not relevant. It's you have to be have a, a program, a strict program, I feel, set up so that when that information comes in, you're not wasting your time. You know what bucket it needs to go into so it can be regurgitated and then pushed back out to the market or pushed back out to the product team or the sales team. And I think that's the challenge that we all face at the moment. So. Mark, do you agree with everyone else here so far on, on the marketing owning this? Yeah, I mean, really, you got to have one place to go in the company, I believe, to, to try to make sense of it and to disseminate it out. And my view is marketing is a place for that. Mary, you may have something. Yeah, I just, uh, I think one of the hardest things sometimes is uh, going back to sales and saying, no, we're not going to create a certain product. And because we've got what? salespeople coming in and saying, we could sell this, we could sell this. So we recently had an example where we were just getting so much strong feedback from from the field that my, my team just 
we just hammered it home with marketing to say we have got to provide this product and we finally got them to listen. It was just such an overwhelming amount of this is a great sales opportunity, um, but it was a struggle sometimes. So I just I think the conflict between the between the inputs can be interesting also and in having to resolve that. Um, and in this particular case, my team won, so we were happy. <laughs> well, the love hate relationship between sales and marketing is a whole nother therapeutic session for us. We won't go down that that road quite yet. Um, all right, so so we've got a group of folks out here. We're going to toss it open for um, uh, for some questions for you all in a minute. Um, but you've, you've absolutely convinced them that, that we as executives need to, to stop hammering our prospects, stop uh, just trying to, to sell them through through brute force and, and really need to start listening to them. So I want each of you to share with us what's the first thing we should do when we leave this meeting today to, to put in place a uh, customer or buying listening strategy. I would, for me, I would say one thing that has really helped us recently is, involve, as I was saying earlier, is involving our customers and using them to tell stories and using them to educate. For the first time ever, we had a user conference just for one of our divisions. Uh, it was three weeks ago, actually. And we actually asked some clients to present sessions, and we asked them to get up in front of our other customers and talk about their, the way they use their products. And what we found is, as you were saying earlier, the customers, other customers that didn't know what they wanted to buy and they didn't know what they needed, these customers basically showed them a light by saying, oh, look, we're doing this and now we're making this much money and so on and so forth. And they ended up realizing, oh, we need that solution, but we didn't know we needed it in the first place. So I think listening to the customers or getting them to tell your current customers is, is a good Okay. So, so Mike, um, there's that point and then there's another point here made about uh, your customers really don't know what, what they want and so we're, we're taking both the points that are made here and putting them into play now we're in transition with our platform and so the technology that's driving how we you know, sell our services needs, needs to be revamped, made more robust, just improved. And so what we've done is gone out to the to the existing base and asked our customers for representatives that would be willing to help in this, uh, in, in effect, help us to help them. And uh, and our, our goal and our hope is that we're going to develop a product that's really, you know, really driven from customer feedback from the ground up that will put us in position to continue to grow the business, you know, based on things that our customers have told us. And I think that's getting, getting across our whole company as a way that we're going to do business by listening, by understanding what our customers are telling us and then, and then making decisions based on that. My takeaway point here would be to decide the level of commitment that you want to have within your organization when it comes to listening to customers. Is it just something that the marketing team is going to do or is it something that is important to everyone in the company? And for an organization like CBON that services small businesses, we have probably 10,000 customers here in Atlanta. So every one of our employees knows somebody who is a customer, walks into a customer when you go to the dentist or to your attorney, or you may be working for a customer. So for us, it's something that is, as I said before, systemic. It's something everybody in the company needs to think about and know how to provide feedback for, and ultimately gets reflected in even our HR systems like our company bonus. I think my biggest takeaway would be to, to go back and sort of um, go to marketing and, and kind of take an inventory of what the listening mechanisms are to make sure you're familiar because, like you said, there's surveys, there's advisory boards, there's user groups, there's all kinds of inputs, and in some respects, I think your roles, you're the best one to make sure that it's being interpreted correctly and it is top-down how it's going to be used. So I would sort of figure out where you're at today to start to put a, a more structured plan in place on how you're going to use it. Um, right. I agree with the points. I think what's amazing is so many companies, you know, they've got a, a customer service department, they have a sales department, they say we're all dedicated to customers and say, okay, give me your customer listing strategy, your customer experience strategy, and they get kind of a blank look. The true test of anything is put on a piece of paper. I was going to suggest that you, you know, for companies right now to get a better job listening, first thing is go back and 
you know, and do a, 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 a introspection look at your company and say, what are the various ways we're listening to customers? Are we capturing all the ways we listen to customers? What are we doing with it? Where does it come in? How quickly are we to respond? And document that so you establish a baseline and then set up some metrics so that you know six months from now we've done a better job, we list more customers. Um, sometimes also it's just, it's like, like I said, you know, the executive sponsoring program, things like that. An hour-long discussion with one customer can be more profitable and generate more revenue than sending out a mass mailing of 10,000 emails to 10,000 prospects. And it's really focusing on that. In fact, I haven't finished, in fact, I'm going to call the individual, but I just read an article the other day where a company's trying to eliminate email. You know, just because if you think about it, as they say, just every morning going through and deleting the emails that you don't want to read takes a half hour. And so uh, I think there's, right now, I don't think anybody's got all the right answers in this day and age where you get this exponential growth of data and so many different ways to interact with customers and customers being bombarded with messages. Um, I think that the, the, the fun time of where we're at right now, the fun part is the fact that uh, I don't think anybody's got really good answers for how to do this in the future. I think there's a chance for all of us to kind of explore and create brand new models. Um, I will say that uh, we talked about you know satisfying the customer and listening to the customer. There was a book written years ago called Customer Satisfaction is Worthless, Customer Loyalty is Priceless by Jeffrey Gettemer. Still one of the best quality books I've ever read. And you know, getting customers involved. You don't want satisfied customers, you want loyal customers. You want customers that will fight not to switch. They say, see beyond or EPIX, that is my company. I'm not going anywhere else. And uh, you do that by developing relationships. And you can have all the technology in the world, it's important. But at the end of the day, you got to sit down in front of them and talk to them. Great. I'm not going to ask the room to raise their hands and tell us when's the last time you talked to your customers, but I'm going to ask the room to raise their hands and, and ask some great questions uh, for our panelists. And we'll open it up here to you all. I know there's some questions out there. Um, I'm glad to hear you talking a lot about calling people. I'm, I'm uh, oh, no, okay. mystified by the... Uh, the uh, Oh, I get to can I do my eldest one? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I'm glad to hear you talking about uh, calling people, and yet some of the trends of websites is to eliminate phone numbers. What's the uh, what's the philosophy there? Are we missing something? We try to answer our phones and make it easy to call us, but is there some benefit to not putting your phone number on the website? Well, it's, it's all it's all really. Coming out of call center business, that's that's really about cost. Yeah, it it's, just a, 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 it's just a cost saving uh, measure that companies have, have taken and really trying to push their customers to self serve. You know, uh, it depends, you know, about the, the scale and the size of a business as to whether or not that strategy is one that's solid or sound. Um, so that said. Um, I, I believe that you know opening up all the lines of communication to your customers so that you can so that they can feel very good about their relationship with you is very important. So you know can't make a statement about whether or not a company can afford to to have that happen. You know given you know how, how many calls some companies have to, to, to take. But you know in the end it's it's always about I think giving them access. So John. Process of conducting a survey. Your, our table talked about a number of methods using independent third parties or conducting them yourselves, doing it in person, doing it by telephone. Are there any suggestions about the best way to get good results from a customer survey? Uh, I'll throw my experience. I've done a bunch of customer surveys, and for the longest time, the magic word was iPod. If they participate in the survey, you gave away an iPod. Now it's an iPad. There's going to be an I something in the future. It's an incentive. Um, you know, it's really difficult because, again, you know, John, as you know, we're, we're bombarded with emails. And they, you know, you, you call up and you work with somebody, and then they, they send you a customer survey and say, oh, it's going to take you 10, 15 minutes to do that. Do I really have the time to do it? Um, I think the real trick is being very selective, number one. Uh, number two is personalizing the invitation. So it doesn't look like, hey, we just sent this email out to 100,000 people who would like your input. Um, thirdly is knowing they're going to get some kind of feedback, some kind of response back to it. Because um, the first the first time they get that survey, it's, the challenge is going to be to A, get them to do it, and then B, to 
do another one maybe a year from now. So they got a really good experience with that first one. But um, one of the things that we did, and again, I did, different people got different ideas. I'm looking forward to hearing them. But we would always put together and send them. If you fill out the survey or the drawing for uh, you know an iPod or an iPad or something like that, then people people tend to do that for some reason. They were more interested in getting an iPad than a two thousand dollar flat screen TVs. But you know, so that's what we did. It's, yeah. I mean, incentive is amazing. I'll, I'll agree. I mean, we've even gone as low as we gave away jelly beans, and you would have been surprised at how many people just wanted a pack of jelly beans. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, but also, I think for us, uh, we do a lot of client surveys based on that with incentive and things like that. But if we're going more in depth, then we're wanting to sort of take it into a productization style of survey where we want to build out some new technology or we want to improve a product in a way, we tend to get a lot more specific and maybe do sort of a, a lunch or a user group or something like that and survey individuals face to face and get them involved in the conversation. Um, whereas if it's you know a survey about, well, you know, you came to our user group conference, did you enjoy it? That's where we'll do something like a incentive-based online survey. So it, I think it just depends on on the, the quality of the information you want to get. So. And I'm willing to bet, Mary, not to put you on the spot, but I, I bet when the uh, senior leadership team of CBON made some phone calls to to customers, they, they got responses back because that's out of the norm, right? Yeah, we definitely had great response to our executives reaching out, and those were very valuable conversations that I mentioned. If I think about the, I'll say, transactional type survey where you're just sending the email out, the point that I'll throw in there is that timing is important. So we have selected very key points in the customer's life cycle to send those surveys so that we know we're hitting them at a point in time where they will be most willing to give us feedback, and then that also helps us with consistency across the across the customer experience. And I'll just reiterate what everyone else has said, which is that being committed to responding to the feedback that you get from customers, whether it's positive or negative, is absolutely credible. If it, critical, there's nothing that will blow credibility more than a customer that has given you some very valuable feedback and, and you're not responding to it. And that requires organizational commitment. It takes resources and process and methodology, but it is absolutely the most important part, I think, of the survey process. Um, I would just add to that that um, you need to keep the surveys really, really short. And I don't think it matters so much whether you use a third party or um, have your own staff, depending on how you direct them. Um, and there's lots of you know, theories written on, you know, should you say you're, you know, it's a blind survey versus no. Well, if you're going to follow up, you have to know who they are. So I think we've, we've pretty much gone away from a lot of the blind surveys for um, client loyalty. And then I think the last thing is if you're not getting a response, you have one or two problems. Either you're not uh, reaching out to the right people at the customer or you have a bigger problem, that is something you need to be aware of because they're not responding. If, if they're not responding, it's an issue of, um, you know, do they value the partnership as much as you think they do? So I think you got to be careful to not have blinders on um, about who you're, who you're asking the questions of because it does tell you something. Yes. Hi. Right, one thing I haven't heard much about today is mobile, mobile engagement. I hear a little bit about email and some web and social. Um, one thing that we're finding to go into the, the points that have just recently been made about creating that unique identifier for that person, no matter what their engagement or touch point is with the company. Um, do you have currently in your practices or have you guys seen trends toward preferences for somebody being able to establish as a customer if it's uh, you know it's my monthly statement, please send it to me via email. But if you have a little burst survey, which we find to be much more effective than the 10 to 15 minute surveys, if, if you've got something like that, or an alert announcement or update, please send it to me via text versus social for more announcements in my industry kind of thing. Finding a way to create that preference profile, not just a DMA profile, but the preferences and how you touch and engage with customers, we find it valuable. I haven't heard much about that. I would love to hear your answer. I'll jump in. I think you're, you're absolutely right. The data now gives us both office numbers, cell phones, and you know, email private versus we have so much more data on folks, and you you do have to sort of test what works. Like 
um, you know, when you're doing demand gen, some people, you, you can't get people on the phone. I mean, we all know that, right? You just can't get people on the phone. It's very hard to get um, folks to call you back. Um, and you can try cell phone, and you are going to get one or two responses. Either that's the primary means of communication people use, and they don't think twice about it, or they still don't want you to call the cell phone. So that's where that CRM becomes very important of how that person wants to be reached, and it, it's not the same for everybody. Um, but I think you're right. We've started using more text messages before an event. If they've got an appointment, just a quick text reminder that they've got an appointment in two hours. That has been very well received as that reminder. So I think if you use it very sparingly, you can't you know, push a lot to those phones in a B2B. It may be very different from a, a B2C standpoint. I just, I'll throw out the idea is that in a, in a world of a million products, we're getting moving to a model where every product is customized for that specific individual. And that's from preferences. And you bring up an excellent point, you know, how you want to be contacted, how often you want to be contacted. And this comes from, you know, really understanding your customers, but also dialog dialoguing with your customers. And that particular customer, let them design their own customer experience. How often you want to be contacted? When you want to be contacted? If you have a problem, what, you know, what's the process you'd like? is the one thing we can do with technology, and because we are capturing so much information about individuals and companies and things like that, is the trend's gonna be, we are gonna tailor the customer experience. It's gonna be unique for every individual, every individual customer, every individual company. And uh, you can do that with technology. You can't have, if you got 200 customers, you can't have 200 business models, but you can have 200, 200 different ways for your technology to interact with those customers. Yeah, I tend to completely agree with that. We give uh, customers or potential customers the option. I mean, they can choose to be contacted by by a text, or they can choose to be contacted. Some just want to be contacted over social media. It's bizarre. Some people just want you to tweet messages to them all day long. But some people want text, or some people want an email. And I think giving them that option also feels that, that they have some more power in the relationship you know, um, so we give them the option. Not many people, I'll be say from personal experience, not texting hasn't been huge for us, not a whole lot, but we're very sort of financial insurance, healthcare technology, so a lot of the financial based guys, the social media is big for them because they'll sit and watch Twitter feeds from companies they're following or doing business with so it's sometimes it's a good way to get them because it'll come up on their on their platform on their screen so that works well for us too. And, and one of the trends um, one of the trends that marketers are just starting to, to catch on to and it's uh, understandable given the adoption cycle but most marketing and automation systems from the pure prospect marketing side uh, enabled you have a preference center which then lets your prospects start to choose how they want to be marketed not just um, the content and type, but the, the format also. And I think that we're going to see preference centers on B2B websites pop up as a bigger and bigger uh, uh, trend in the coming year from them. Because people are learning the true powers of these marketing automation systems and checking all the features off the list to get to the preference center. And I think that will be a big aha for, for marketers. Sammy? Yeah. Um Two-part question around benchmarks or indexes you may use to track customer uh, satisfaction or loyalty. As you said, at our table, we had some folks that used Net Promoter Score, NPS. We had one that used CSI. Um, and we had a few folks that linked those to employee uh, compensation or bonus, as you mentioned. So the first part of the question is, what uh, benchmarks or indexes do you use internal, based on industry or Internally, like NPS or CSI, um, in order to track, and then how do you use them? Do you, uh, you know, share them with, you know, customers? Uh, do you share them internally? And if you link it to compensation, do you do that at the uh, at the entire company level, department level, individual level? Just interested in what metrics and benchmarks you use and, and how you use them. Uh, Sammy, I'll, I'll take that uh, in the last uh, the last company, which again we were outsourced call center provider, and so on behalf of our customers, those uh, every NPS, CSI, both both metrics were used and used around uh, both telling the story for how that that company was doing around those metrics, but then also to drive um, uh, the incentive. 
programs for them for the employees that were responsible for for driving those results and both of, both were used effectively so it, it, it does depend on what your company has the most confidence in in terms of uh, the, the which which metric that you, you ultimately choose of those that are out there now um, but you know again the use of it was 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 dual for to, to message how well that the company was doing toward customer experience and then also to drive um, behavior amongst the employee base. We also use Net Promoter Score, and by engaging with customer side, the company that runs that, uh, besides just having them execute the survey for us, it also gave us access to their expertise. So there's an art to understanding how to write survey questions that get you the right information back. Um, so they've helped us with this, the strategy around the surveys. And then, of course, that also gave us access to being able to benchmark against others. And having an association with that outside organization was also necessary for our auditors that needed to be participating in that process because it was tied to our bonus. So in that case, it's, it was very important that we not just be doing it internally, but that we had external support. Did you tie the bonus at the department level or at the, did you have an The bonus or? is across company. So everybody, we have a company-wide bonus structure, okay. and so everybody is held to the same the same level. Okay. I'll give a real simple answer. You asked about the benchmarks, revenue and EBITDA. Uh, if you're doing a good job listening to customers, sales will grow. Uh, but what, you know, and again, these folks can give you a lot more detail in terms of all the different types of metrics you could use, and you can look up a lot of those. But one metric that I've always looked at is how many new customers come in based on a reference from an existing customer. That is extremely important to me. Because again, I don't want satisfied customers. I want loyal customers. And right now, I have customers that you know their management has said, "Well, you need to take a look at some other people." And they said, "No, we're going to use them. They're the best. We like them. We trust them. We have that relationship. We have that loyalty, and uh, that's just absolutely critical to what we do." Okay. Well, I want to uh, thank the panel here for for their words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you again, Mike, uh, the entire panel. I've got a token of our appreciation I'll share with you here in a moment. As a finance guy, I'd love to leave it with the with Don, your comment of time, marketing, and sales to revenue and even Don. So thank you personally. Uh, appreciate, everybody. Line measure. I try to get <laughs> appreciate everyone coming this morning um, and your time and attention this morning. We look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, in July, our topic of breakfast is going to be on healthcare services. How can tech companies reduce expenses and their legal expo exposure? We've got a great panel and uh, interesting topic coming up next month. Thanks again for everyone. Um, we have no board meeting this month, but I know we do have a quick announcement from Johnny. One thing about next, week's, next month's meeting is important. The Supreme Court case is scheduled to come out in the next couple of weeks, so that this month. So that the panel next month will be talking about that case and its impact on technology companies. So this isn't just some other panel discussion on health care. This will be specifically related to tech companies and the U.S. Supreme Court case. Thank you, John. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.